Uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, thymic tumors, and believe it or not, there's actually uh, quite a lot to talk about um, for this set of uh, rare tumors. Uh, for disclosures, I have had some research funding from uh, Lilly and Bristol Myers, which is pertinent to this talk. So we'll talk a little bit about surgical techniques as well as some uh, prospective clinical trials done in, in this uh, area. Some uh, multi-institutional collaborations which have led to revisions of the WHO classification system as well as a new staging system. And then we'll wrap up with a little uh, data about molecular profiling and what's next on the horizon. So first off, from surgical techniques, obviously we've seen over the last uh, 10 or 15 years a move towards more minimally invasive surgery, and you know that we've gone from the traditional open sternotomy to what uh, a minimally invasive approach. And this shows a, a typical uh, setup for a uh, VATS or minimally invasive approach with uh, three ports. You know, with this type of visualization, you can see here with the, uh, the anominate vein exposed there and the thymus uh, retracted anteriorly that you can get very uh, good visualization uh, in a tight space. And now, obviously, we've had application of uh, robotics uh, to uh, minimally invasive approaches to thymectomy. So just, I just want to see a show of hands. How many people out there are doing VATS or robotic uh, thymectomies? So pretty much the majority of people. And it seems like it wasn't even that long ago that I felt that, that uh, VATS was sort of frowned upon for taking out uh, a thymic tumor. And probably the largest uh, experience uh, in robotic thymectomy comes out of um, Berlin in Germany, and over 450 robotic thymectomies, of which 120 or so were done actually for thymic neoplasms. An interesting approach that I've seen now, which seems to be popular, uh, particularly over in Asia, is this subxiphoid uh, approach uh, to a minimally invasive thymectomy. Which, which seems to make a lot of sense uh, given that it's really a midline structure as opposed to approaching this from a lateral approach, but it's not something that I've actually um, seen or done yet myself. So I want to focus on, highlight just a couple of actual prospective uh, clinical trials in the surgical arena. One important one came out of uh, a multi-institutional trial led by Bob Course, basically giving induction chemoradiation for patients that have locally advanced tumors. They gave them cisplatinotoposide plus 4,500 uh, centigrade of uh, radiation up front and then looked at pathologic and uh, radiographic responses. They had 21 patients across the four institutions. Uh, all of them completed radiation, um, but there was you know, significant toxicity with a 40%, uh, upwards of 40% having grade three or four toxicity in these patients. But they did pretty well with surgery, with 77% uh, obtaining a complete resection. Uh, unfortunately, there weren't any complete pathologic responses to this induction therapy, but they did note that uh, about a quarter of them had nearly a complete pathologic response, or less than 10% residual viable tumor, with most of these happening in the carcinomas. Out of the patients who were completely resected, they had no recurrence yet, and with a median follow-up of 27 months. But as I mentioned, you know, there was some significant toxicity with 40% having grade three or four serious adverse events, including one patient with cardiac arrest during the induction protocol. And subsequently, two patients did die of surgical complications. So with 20 patients, we're talking close to 10% overall mortality. These are obviously big tumors and difficult cases. And so this sort of reflects, I think, the reality of, of addressing these patients. But overall, this, uh, this uh, induction regimen was associated with a pretty high rate of complete resection for these difficult uh, patients with a near complete pathologic response in a quarter of them. And perhaps this may be oriented best, uh, the best responders may be those patients with thymic carcinomas. Now, another approach was uh, looked at EGFR and thymoma. Uh, many studies have demonstrated that there was a high expression or overexpression of EGFR and thymoma. 
And there were case reports that showed cetuximab uh, having, uh, leading to partial responses in these patients. So following in the lead of other uh, disease sites such as colorectal and head and neck, uh, we conducted a trial of com combination therapy with cetuximab uh, and standard chemotherapy, which is CAP, or cisplatin, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide uh, in patients with stage three or four A uh, thymoma leading to subsequent resection. This trial is, is uh, ongoing and the results should be coming out later on this year. But, you know, really within this rare disease, it's difficult to gain any uh, significant um, ground, um, even single institutions or even with a handful of institutions. And so really, though, I think the way forward is, is multi-institutional collaborations. So about seven years ago, the International Thymic Malignancy Interest Group um, was formed, started in, um, with a meeting in New York in 2010, and every year subsequently has rotated around to a different continent. They have had seven meetings now in, uh, in a row, and there's been growing interest um, and, uh, and momentum with this group. It's truly a multidisciplinary group, and it's truly an international group with surgeons, medical oncologists, pathologists, uh, neurologists, radiation oncologists participating, and, and representation from, from uh, North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. This just gives you a sense of the participants uh, who have been contributing data into this group across, across the globe, North, uh, North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And one of the main projects that the group undertook was the formation of an international database to pool data across the globe together. <clears throat> we created this uh, database several years ago, and uh, over the course of uh, essentially a year, was able to collect data on close to 8,000 patients across the globe. This just gives you sort of a sense of, of the international collaboration with the uh, institutions uh, represented here who, who were contributors to the database across Europe, across Asia, across uh, the U.S. and North America, and even in Argentina and South America. So this was primarily intended to be a resource uh, for research. And subsequently, multiple publications have come out using this data set, looking at carcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors, histology, uh, minimally invasive approaches, and the value of postoperative radiation therapy in resected patients. Now, who here knows who the person standing in the middle here is? That's Cam right on the right and myself on the left. Does anybody know who the person standing in the middle here is? So this is Akira Masaoka, uh, who, who passed away uh, just a few years ago. But he is, of course, the founder of the, his eponymous staging system, the Masaoka staging system, which was published in 1981, so 36 years ago. And we're st still using it today, but you can see it was based off of 96 patients. And it's long been thought that there were many sort of ambiguities in that staging system and there was a need to sort of formally develop a TNM staging classification. So ISLAC, the International Association for Study of Lung Cancer, together with ITMIG, put forth a stage classification project starting several years ago and using part of that database that we, we just talked about and inclusion of other data sets from Japan and Europe uh, put together about 10,000 patients. Uh, compare that back to the 96 patients that Masaoka uh, originally started with. And this was uh, run through CRAB, Cancer Research and Biostatistics, based out of Seattle, who had done the uh, lung staging effort. So this, turned, this was an effort that created many, many, many survival graphs like these and looking at cut points and uh, and, and different criteria as such. But uh, in the end, the, the results of this were published in a series of uh, publications that are in a uh, JTO, uh, Journal of Thoracic Oncology Supplement, laying out all the recommendations and proposals. But this is basically it here. So in the terms of the T category, we find things into uh, T1A and B, which is 
with V extension into mediastinal pleura. They separated that out specifically so they could capture that information in the future to see whether or not this truly is actually prognostic. Pericardium as an uh, as, uh, 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 area of invasion for T2 separately because they've felt that pericardial resection is sort of more straightforward than re resection of, say, the superior vena cava, which would fall into the T3 category, and T4 essentially reflecting those areas that would be felt to be uh, either inoperable or technically uh, challenging to resect. There's specifically separated out nodal metastases from pleural and pericardial metastases uh, with the N and, N and M categories. And to help with that, they created uh, a concept of a node map with respect to uh, sort of what nodes might be taken out together with the thymectomy as opposed to deeper or uh, extra regional sites uh, of nodes, which would be in the N2 category. So they displayed this sort of graphically also uh, uh, in the papers here, again showing sort of the different levels of invasion into either the pleura or to the pericardium, uh, into the cava or into, the, for example, the, uh, the aorta. And then the distinctions between nodal uh, involvement and uh, distant metastatic involvement. This is how the uh, stage groupings uh, break out. And essentially, up until stage three, it's still based on the local invasion of the tumor with the different categories of four, separating out the involvement of nodes and or pleural metastases. This has now been formally recognized by both the AJCC and the UICC uh, in their newest uh, editions uh, of their staging manuals, which are, which are now currently out. So as part of the collaboration also, they were able to bring pathologists together to sort of make some revisions and clarifications about their WHO histologic classification, which has led to a lot of sort of some confusion across pathologists as well as the surgeons looking at the pathology reports. But one of the interesting things that did come out of this is the, the one, finally they've accepted that all thymomas should be considered malignant. Up until this point, there was still a, a classification that, that felt that some thymomas were considered benign. And in fact, that's, that's reflected uh, in our current uh, uh, ICD codes. Um, and if you look, try to look at SEER data, for example, about uh, the epidemiology of thymoma, it leaves out all those patients who had been coded as benign thymoma. So they're not actually tracked in any of the SEER data. They also came up with some new rules to define what happens if you have uh, multiple subtypes. So if you have B3, B2, B1, to classify this in descending order of the most prevalent areas. They also identified and recognized a variant of atypical type A, which is a new, more aggressive variant uh, compared to the type A's that were normally thought to be much more uh, indolent in nature. And finally, some additional guidance on separating that fine line between the B3 thymomas, which tend to be the more aggressive ones, and frank thymic carcinoma. So this leads me into sort of some uh, insights about the molecular landscape. And <clears throat> this, uh, this figure here sort of shows in increasing order the frequency of somatic mutations across the different cancer types with um, melanoma being all the way on the far right with the most uh, highest frequency of mutations. Um, and the question is where, sort of where would thymoma sort of fall into this and the initial uh, attempts at looking at this seem to suggest that it's going to be likely on the lower end of the scale in terms of frequency of mutations. But one interesting one that has come out in high prevalence in thymomas exclusively is this missense mutation in GTF2I, which has not been previously recognized in other cancer types. And this was uh, published by um, Beppe Giacconi's group um, coming out of the uh, NIH uh, in nature. And if you look at this, this table shows the frequency of this particular mutation across cancer types, and the one that's highest on the left 
is breast at 7%. But what he found was that the prevalence in thymoma was 30%. So it would be, if there was a bar on this graph, it would be, it would go off the top of the slide. And this seems to be unique to thymoma. Nobody really knows exactly sort of its role, although it seems to play a part in cell cycle uh, uh, regulation. <clears throat> so the Cancer Genome Atlas actually has been conducting work on uh, thymoma and thymic tumors. And uh, again, looking across all the different uh, platforms, including methylation, RNA, uh, SNPs, microRNAs, and complete uh, exome sequencing. And that data should be forthcoming uh, shortly, later this year. So really on the horizon, the ITMIG is looking to continue collection of data. They've put together this uh, web-based uh, platform for data entry, which has uh, made it very easy to, to submit cases and to put in details about their, about their cases. And this will lead to further refinements in the staging system and further research projects. But also, and just an allusion to the previous talk about immunotherapy, there's a lot of interest in uh, applying this with a word of caution that in this disease, you know, uh, where immune uh, uh, syndromes are, are quite widespread, there's a great concern about the, 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 uh, the likelihood of immune response mediated adverse events and some reluctance to apply these to thymomas where myasthenia is more prevalent than say thymic carcinomas where uh, myasthenia gravis is, is much less common. There are also some uh, trial uh, proposals being initiated and, uh, by ITMIG, including uh, a, a concept for patients with stage 4A disease, uh, looking at hyperperfusion in these patients, as well as an adjuvant postoperative radiation uh, trial for patients with resected thymic tumors. So I'll just uh, close by putting in a, a plug for the next uh, meeting of ITMIG, which is going to be later this year in September. It's going to be in Turin in uh, northern Italy in September, which will be a great time of year to, to visit a really a fantastic uh, part, of the, part of the country. So thanks very much and uh, look forward to any questions.